Awesome. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, John Gray, who's been so gracious at helping us set up our TU Aquatic Entomology series. Uh, this will be our third installment. Uh, if you missed the first two, uh, Mike and Bill, we do have those on our website. So you can go back, uh, check them out. So, turn it over to John. I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker. Tonight we're continuing our aquatic entomology series with stoneflies as the topic of discussion. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that our speaker has a wealth of knowledge about stoneflies. We're lucky to have him with us tonight. He is the owner of Angler Services, which is a fly fishing guide and outfitting company based in Charlotte. In addition to guiding people on fly fishing trips throughout the southeast, he also sets up excursions to the western United States and South America. Fantastic fly fisher. He has forgot more about fly fishing than I know. I've spent many hours on the water with him and I can tell you that I would not want to go through any water that he has already fished through. <laughs> He's also a broadcaster. For years, he has been the co-host of the Carolina Outdoors show on WBT Radio. It's on every Saturday morning at 5 a.m. For those of you that don't get up every Saturday morning at 5 a.m., <laughs> the replays of the show are available on the WBT website. He is a fantastic hunter. For the last couple of years, I've been lucky to go with him to his family farm in Missouri for deer hunting. And I can tell you from watching him in action, he is a capable and tenacious hunter. He is an excellent shotgun shooter. He takes his sporting clays very seriously. Not only is he a great shot, he's a tremendous coach to many people. In fact, one of the local high school teams that he coached has recently gone on to win a national championship. And with all that going for him, I hope that he soon announces his candidacy for President of the United States. <laughs> because I believe he could do that job exceedingly well, just as he does everything else. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Don Yeager. Crank the lights up a bit here. Yeah. I'm proud to say I taught John well because he understands something very important. Never let the facts ruin a good story. <laughs> so, most of you folks have been trout fishing for a while, I assume, and the rest of you are interested in getting into it. One of the most important things in trout fishing that I've been asked year after year after year is how do you know what flies to fish? Well, it's really simple. You read the menu. The menu is fairly clearly written in the bottom of every trout stream in the world. You go out there in shallow, fast-moving water, you pick up a rock and you look to see what's crawling around on it. And one of the biggest things you're going to see is stone flies. Stone flies are especially important in the wintertime. Stone flies are easier to identify. They're that big. <laughs> well, maybe not quite. But the thing that they all have that makes them very easily distinguishable from a mayfly is they have two wing cases. A mayfly only has one. He also has a collar that many people believe is a wing case, but it's not. It's where his head attaches to the body. So his wings are going to form and grow in these two wing cases right here. And if he is a flying insect, he's going to be a biplane. He's got two sets of wings. If you look at the illustration that I've sent you here, bottom left corner is a flying golden stone fly right there. Okay? That's the profile when he flies. He very distinctly has two wings on each side. Looks a lot like a dragonfly when he's flying. When he lands, his wings retract straight down his body like a wasp. Okay, has the exact same profile. From the side, he is very flat with those wings laying straight down his body. That's important to know because it makes him easy to recognize on a string. 
Stoneflies can live from one to three years subsurface. Little yellow sallies, a very important nymph to John Gray. Probably catches what percentage of your fish in a year's time on a lot. yellow sally nymphs, a, a big lot. number. Yeah. Yellow sally nymphs, best example is probably going to be a calico nymph. I don't know if many of you are familiar with that, it's bright yellow on the stomach and a turkey quill on the back side. I'm just going to pass some, some flies around if you'll pass them all the way down and around and you guys do the same thing going the other way. These are some examples of stone fly nymphs. Pat's rubber legs, one of the most well-known flies and often used in North and South Carolina, is a stone fly nymph. Okay? Stone flies in this area, there's three primarily examples that we're concerned about. Or four, excuse me. There's the golden stone, which is this guy over here. Dark, rusty, kind of goldish color, lighter on the stomach, darker on the back with some mottled uh, markings on the wing cases and so forth. Typically gets up to about an inch and a quarter long here. About a size big hook. Maybe a six on some occasions. I'd always rather be small than big. A golden stone fly actually lives three years subsurface. So there's a lot of opportunities for a trout to eat a golden stone. Okay? Next two very important ones are the giant blacks and the brown stones. And they are exactly what they sound like. The giant black, I've seen them as long as three inches. It's unusual, but I've seen them that big. Most typically an inch and a half. The brown stones, again, in that inch and a quarter, inch and a half range. Okay? And then the little yellow sally. Little yellow Sally is easy to recognize because she is as bright yellow as that can right there. Hold that up for me. And they do have even mutations that come out chartreuse like the koozie on that one. You'll see them flying, you'll see them in the stream beds. At full growth, they're only about a half inch long. Okay? Again, very easily recognized because they are bright yellow, their wings are bright yellow. Again, they fly, they look like a little biplane like a dragonfly. All right, now the thing that all stones, by the way, the brown and black stones are two years subsurface. The yellow sallies, one of the reasons that John Gray is so successful with that fly is they have a one year life cycle. They hatch every year, over and over and over a year. Again, very consistent, the same numbers every year, over and over and over. Golden stones, as you can imagine, there's a couple of years where there's not many around, and all of a sudden they're everywhere on that third year. Same thing with browns and blacks. Okay? But the whole time they're not hatching, they're subsurface and they're growing. Now one of the important things about all these critters is that they crawl out on a rock or a log to emerge. They split an exoskeleton and they crawl out of it and they leave that skeleton behind like a locust or cicada does in your yard. Okay, so they don't come up through the water column. That's very, very rare. They crawl out on a rocker log, split that exoskeleton and crawl out and become a flying insect. They fly around from two to, two to 10 days, they mate, they come back and they lay their eggs. When they lay their eggs, they do one of two things. They either land on a rock or a log, <coughs> drop their abdomen in the water, lay their eggs, or more likely, they flutter on the surface, <coughs> laying eggs and dropping them as they go. We'll come back to that a little later in the program. I've got a little story to tell you about a trout and a fluttering caddis. And the trout was known as the Michael Jordan of brook trout. We'll come back to that. But again, they all have that very flat profile. They all have six insect legs. At the end of each one of those legs, they have two toes. They have 12 points of attachment when they're walking on a stream in the bottom. They have two widespread distinct tail fibers that are really stabilizer bars. And they have two antennas. A stonefly can walk under a waterfall. He's a whole lot better at wading than we are because he's got these pointy little toes and he's got 12 of them he's hanging on with. Matter of fact, when you pick up a rock, a lot of times you'll see the bug that runs and jumps off. That was a stonefly. He's that quick. He can move very, very fast. So when you pick that rock up, 
Water's coming this way, you roll it downstream and turn it up so they don't wash off on you. And you'll start to learn a lot of things and see a lot of things and you'll start to have a lot of questions and hopefully you'll talk to each other and start talking about mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies, and midges. Midges. Right. The midge man. All right. So again, one to three years subsurface, a couple of days to almost two weeks of the flying insect. The yellow sally, hatching every year. It's also, it's very often the size of a mayfly now, but it's very easy to distinguish because it's very flexible in the middle because of all these segments. And it very clearly has a collar and two wing cases, two stabilizer bars, and two antennas. Okay? So the yellow sally can be very, very important. Teleco nymphs, yellow soft tackles, uh, if you've got the box that has the more realistic flies, the lighter colored fly in that. Now let's talk about lighter color because that's something that's very important in nymph fishing. Stone fly, especially the ones that are in there two and three years, molt. They have an exoskeleton, so they're just like a crab. They eventually molt that shell and just like a soft shell crab, during that time they are very helpless. They're also very light colored. Because they're helpless, they wash off the rock and have to get a hold of another one. Because they're light colored, we try to focus on that. So I would always, whenever tying any of these color supplies, I would always go lighter than dark. Instead of a black, a charcoal gray. Instead of a brown, more of a tan. Instead of a bright yellow, a very very like khaki. They molt 12 to 13 times in two to three years. Now you think about that, that gives trout a lot of opportunity to capitalize on something that's a whole lot more food than a midge. Okay? So that's very important. Imagine being underwater 36 months, molting 12 to 13 times, and being very vulnerable to a trout. So trout get very impressed on these things and they make a very good lead fly, especially in the winter time. Okay? Fish in the winter time, they're cold blooded, they slow down a little bit, you gotta make sure they see the fly. What would I pair with them? Something else that's gonna happen early on in the spring, olive hairs here is turning into blue winged olives, olive caddises and black caddises turning into caddises and things of that type. So it's a good potato to put with the meat. By the way, as those of you that have fished Wilson Creek might recognize the high Edgemont Bridge there. Okay? All right, now, in this picture over here, by the way, is Wilson, or is uh, Big Cedar Creek up in uh, Lebanon, Virginia. I uh, went to college as an artist, got out, found out you couldn't make a living from that, like most people that go to college and major in something. Spent 25 years in the hotel business and then the movie A River Runs Through It came out and I was in the right place, right time, switched over to guiding, walked away from that business completely. I've been doing this for 25, 26, 27 years now, somewhere in there. And let me tell you that the more time you find yourself in the mountains and the streams and so forth, the more you can learn because Mother Nature will teach you the lessons about these insects. But the key in all of this is that you've got to bend over and pick up that rock. Now I'm going to pass out a few pictures here. If it's all the same picture, I'm just going to get maybe three to each table. I want you to kind of share it with your neighbors here. And we're going to talk about brook trout facing down a stone fly on the old Bullhead Creek on the pool. Any of you ever heard of Bullhead Creek? Anybody here old enough? <laughs> Bullhead Creek was a piece of uh, catch and release water that was donated to the Stone Mountain State Park back in the 60s. It had been a private fishing club, and at one time you could go there and pay a fee and fish a piece of water on your own that was equal to the stuff that you're going to see down in the Sequoia River in uh, Georgia. I mean, it had eight sections on the river. You got a section, you paid like a $5 fee. It was yours for the day. One day while I was guiding a fellow from England uh, on uh, Bullhead Creek on the home pool, we were fishing with big old yellow stone flies, holding stones. 
And we were doing pretty well. And he could not believe, number one, that we were fishing flies that big. We were fishing probably a size eight. And there was a stone fly flew by doing exactly this, fluttering across the top of the water, distributing her eggs. Okay? Fluttering hard. There's a pattern called whirling um, caddis, and there's also uh, sofa pillows, which is a stone fly pattern. By the way, stone flies out west, they call them salmon flies. It's the same critter. Okay? So, anyway, this. Uh, Stone flies fluttering across the top of the water in this big, smooth pool that's about the size of this, this room. Fluttering across, and all of a sudden, from over by the plunge pool, shoots a brook trout, fast as he can go. Flies over there, stops, <coughs> looks at that stone fly fluttering above him, backs down into the water. And I'll get the guy's attention. I said, look at this, this is gonna be good. This guy looks like Michael Jordan getting ready to jump in the center court. <coughs> This stone fly senses something's wrong and starts working hard. She looks like a C-130 trying to take off with a full load. <laughs> that stone fly gets about that high, and that brook trout makes his move. Up he comes, and he gets hang time like Michael Jordan. <laughs> and you could actually hear his mouth snap shut. The stone fly knows she's in trouble, and she's doing all she can. She looks like a lady in an old western pulling her skirts up running across the prairie, getting the hell out of there because she is within a half inch of death. And of course the stone fly hang, or the, the uh, brook trout hangs a moment, falls back into the water, defeated. By the way, notice the insect on the top left corner. Anybody want to take a shot on what kind of critter that is? It's a little bit different than the stone fly, the stone fly, isn't it? Looks more like a butterfly. It also has mandibles or claspers. Okay. Dobson fly. What's a Dobson fly come out? What's the word? Overmite. Exactly right. Is a Helgramite aquatic insect? Or a kind of. <laughs> Oftentimes we mistake Dobson flies for black stone flies. One of the biggest differences is you notice the big white triangle in each set of wings? That white triangle is very obvious when they're flying around. Dobson flies lay their eggs on tree leaves overhanging the stream. The eggs hatch out into the little nymph, which falls on the ground or in the water, crawls to the water, and spends a year subsurface. During a thunderstorm, Dobson flies, or pilgrimites, crawl out of the stream and burrow under rocks and logs and pupate, and then crawl out as a full-blown flying insect. The biggest difference when they're a flying insect, instead of their wings laying straight back down like a, like a stone fly would, their wings are more shaped like this. Okay. Helgramite, when it's subsurface, has very good armor on the outside. Okay, very hard shell, has eight little spikes on each side that stick out on the side, look like legs, but they're not. Has a set of claspers that will draw blood if you pick him up and let him. Okay, they are one aggressive little critter. They eat baby trout. They eat other insects. They eat fish eggs. They eat anything they can catch. They are the biggest predator in the insect world in the aquatic trout stream. Now, let's really test you on Dobson flies. Take a look at that picture. Is that a male or a female? Male or female Dobson fly? Look at the front end, not the back end. <laughs> 
Yeah, if you look at that picture. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank that Dobson fly has claspers about no, that big. I didn't say that. <laughs> That's a female. If it were a male, they would be three times that size. Oh. Okay. No. And guess why? Because the males fight over the girls and they need equipment to fight with. They will kill each other with those claspers. But they lay their eggs on the leaves, drop off the leaves when they hatch, crawl into the stream, spend a great deal of time there a year, crawl out almost always on a thunderstorm, and they don't know if it's because of the rain, the low pressure, or the vibration of thunder, crawl into the rocks or logs, and pupate. If you happen to be camping on a stream when there is an emergence of crawling out of the stream of helgramites, careful where you're walking, buddy. <laughs> careful where they're walking, because they will grab you and they will draw blood. Okay. <laughs> All right, so whoever guessed Helgramite along the way, be sure to get one of those fish pictures. If not, I've got one for you. The pictures are yours to keep. By the way, uh, the bottom right-hand picture of the golden stone is it emerging or splitting the shell and air drying its wings to become a flying insect, get ready to fly. But again, they don't come up through the water column. Now, stone flies are not only good at crawling, they're also good swimmers. Okay, you've got got actual patterns on S-shaped hooks of swimming um, stoneflies. However, I don't like those at all because those S-shaped hooks are hard to hook up on. Best thing you can do is bring the front end of it down so it kicks the hook point in. But in one occasion, in 25 years of guiding, I have seen fish concentrated on swimming stoneflies. And that was on the uh, Big Horse Creek up at Lansing, North Carolina. Big Horse is a delayed harvest stream. I was there once in May, flat water up along the hay field, good dry fly water typically. Fish splashing, fish splashing. I'm thinking caddises, they're on them and they're on them hard. I tie on caddis with a drop, nothing. Splashy rises, gotta be caddises, right? Caddises swim to the surface, they splashing, 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 splashing. The more I stand there, the more I look, I'm like, it's not caddises. I don't see any caddises flying. It's not caddises. What in the world's going on? Finally, I realized that they are hitting sideways, not vertically. The splashes are sideways. What in the world? So I ease up in there a little further, and I get over against the grass. And if you know that piece of water, there's a bank about that high, and then it gets down to the riverbed. And the water was up some that day, and the grass was almost touching the water. I go over to the grass, stonefly, exoskeletons everywhere. Stoneflies. Stoneflies shallow. Hmm. Dry, dropper stonefly. Well, a little drag, man, boom! Every time you'd mend it, every time you'd kick it, fish would nail it. Fish were coming that far to nail it. Fish were looking all over for them. It's the only time I've ever got into a situation where swimming caddis has really worked. And they were working about 18 inches deep, fished off of a big dry. Anything to keep them up where you could use an indicator, you could use a stimulator, it didn't matter. They were eating them subsurface, 18 inches deep. Golden stone all day long, boom, boom, boom. And the fish will just spread out nice like you expect them to be dry fly fishing. Cast it up, get a drift going, a little bend, just enough to tweak it, bam. One of the unusual things that I've run into, and it's the only time I've ever seen it. Out west, of course, they get a lot of that kind of action with all the the um, salmon flies that hatch out there are much more predictable dates and so forth. Out west, those, uh, those insects all stay near the trout stream because that's where the only vegetation they can eat is, with the willow trees and so forth. And they'll clump up on those willow trees out west. I mean, you can have a handful of them to the point that they're knocking each other back in the water and fish are grabbing them and having a good old time. But that's Stoneflies 101. The main thing I want to leave you with You've got to pick up rocks. You've got to know what's on the menu. If you pick up rocks and you don't see black stones, God sakes, don't tie on a black stone. Okay? If you see yellow stones, golden stones, or yellow sallies, tie it on. It's like going to Cracker Barrel and ordering crepes. If it ain't on the menu, you ain't going to get it. The exact same thing with, with trout. 
They are only going to eat what's available to them. Now, you might wonder if so I'll catch one on a God knows golly whopper that somebody tied up in a class and thought all these purple colors and things look good. But in real nature, it's all about what is Mother Nature sending down the conveyor belt to the dining room. If a fish is feeding from a stationary position, let Mother Nature show it to him. Any questions? That's Stoneflies 101. If any can be of any help in any way, let me know. I've got brochures here for my guide service, and uh, I appreciate you having me down here tonight. Thank you.